Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Sava, and today we're investigating a quite famous and useful diagnostic test for multicollinearity in regression modeling, which is variance inflation factors. And variance inflation factors are quite commonly used and quite frequently cited as the go-to diagnostic test for multicollinearity because of their conceptual simplicity and computational simplicity as well. It's pretty easy to calculate them in Excel, as I'll show you today, as well as due to the fact that they quite nicely correspond both to the definition of multicollinearity, that is, when your independent variables are quite tightly correlated among themselves, as well as to the adverse consequences of multicollinearity that make your regression model uh, imprecise or have some undesirable properties. The major consequence of multicollinearity in regression modeling is variance inflation. That is, that standard errors, all the coefficients that you'll estimate, would be inflated, would be higher than otherwise which leads to a higher rate of type 2 errors. Due to the fact that those standard errors would be inflated, you would not know for sure whether you should reject the null hypothesis or not. Your estimators would become noisy, imprecise, and less reliable. And various inflation factors allow you to measure this distortion, this uh, adverse consequence of multicollinearity quite directly. And that's why they're so handy. So today we'll apply variance inflation factors to our go-to cross-sectional regression model that tries to relate economic growth per capita of 131 countries to some uh, quite common macroeconomic aggregates. And as we are concerned with multicollinearity here, so uh, interrelationships between independent variables, we we'll only need those five today. So here I'll show you a very efficient and simple procedure, how we can calculate variance inflation factors for every single coefficient. Again, variance inflation factors are, are very useful also because they, unlike other tests that just show uh, that this selection of independent variables suffers from multicollinearity or this selection of independent variables does not, also shows you where the most severe multicollinearity comes from. So here we'll need to calculate variance inflation factors for each and every of those five variables that will show by how much, by which factor, the standard errors of those coefficients would be inflated in the regression model. So we'll need to calculate five of them for each of those five variables. And the easiest way of doing it in one go without much um, changes in our spreadsheet would be to use the index function. First of all, we'll need to regress our log GDP per capita, which is our variable one, onto four of the other independent variables we've got. So we would regress uh, in an auxiliary regression our independent variable one onto in independent variables two, three, four, and five to detect any interrelationships that might exist overall. Not only uh, bilateral two-way correlations that a correlation matrix would give, for example, but interrelationships between all five. And that would mean that we'll next need to regress gross capital formation, for example, on these four, then we'll need to regress foreign direct investment onto those four, and so on. And this is where index function comes in handy. Let me show you. First, we'll do uh, the index function and apply it to the variable names, so it's easier to interpret the results and easier to understand that we haven't made a mistake anywhere, and input the indicator variable over here with the locked row. So we lock the uh, columns for our source array, and we lock the row for our indicator variable. And that returns the variable names, but what's even cooler is if we enforce it throughout, all of our variable values would pop up as well. And now we can finally uh, estimate the R squared of the auxiliary regression of our first that would allow us to produce the first variance inflation factor. We would regress log GDP per capita onto these four 
uh, values. And obviously, we could just use the Linus function. And for example, if I apply the Linus function here and introduce our y variable, which is log GDP per capita, and our four uh, additional independent variables, input one and one for the constant and for the additional statistics, and enforce this function, I would get the Linus template. But actually, as per the multicolarity detection procedure, and as per the variance inflation formula over here, the only thing we need is the R squared of the auxiliary regression, which is given, as you might already remember, in the third row of the Linus template, and is the very first um, number in the third row of our Linus template. That means that we can use the index function again here to our advantage to extract the R squared from our auxiliary regression. Now let me show you how to do that. We'll apply the index function to the Linus output. And uh, it is quite um, counterintuitive that you could use it in Excel, but actually the functions allow you to do that quite um, nicely and straightforwardly. So as the argument of our index function, we will have the Linus template, the Linus output, where our first variable, leftmost variable, would be the Y variable, and the other four would be the explanatory variables. Again, one, one, that doesn't change. And then we'll need to remember where the R squared that we actually need for our variance inflation factor calculation comes from. And it comes from the third row and the first column, the leftmost um, value in the third row of the template. And if we use enter here, will extract 0.15 as the R squared, which is exactly what the template that I showed you here gave. Which means that we can now calculate the variance inflation factor, dividing one by one minus the R squared of the auxiliary regression. And that produces a variance inflation factor of 1.18. And here is a good place to discuss the mathematics behind the variance inflation factor formula. If R squared is zero, which would be perfect orthogonality, no uh, two independent variables are ever linked with each other, our uh, standard errors would not be inflated at all, meaning that variance inflation factors would be 1. And this formula provides for that. If R squared is 0, the variance inflation factor is 1. However, as R squared grows, the denominator of this expression decreases, meaning that the variance inflation factor would increase, and that's exactly what you expect from multicolarity, from the consequences of it. As R squared tends to 1, as our independent variables become closer and closer to perfect multicollinearity, the variance inflation factor tends to infinity. If our regresses are perfectly collinear, R squared is 1, then it would be an indeterminate problem, and our standard errors would explode to infinity. That's exactly what you would expect. It would be a very noisy model as an output. So here, we accommodate for all of these properties in just one indicator, the variance inflation factor, and that's why they're so handy, useful, and frequently used. And uh, here, we might uh, want to know what is the acceptable value for a variance inflation factor, and what is deemed unacceptable, what is deemed too high. There are two uh, most commonly used cutoff values. Uh, the more conservative one is 5. So if all of your variance inflation factors are below 5, then the model is acceptable. It does not suffer from multicollinearity. And if they are above 5, then multicollinearity is present and the model is problematic. The second less conservative threshold value, cutoff value, is 10. So again, compare your variance inflation factors to 10. If all of them are less than 10, then uh, proceed with the model. Uh, the diagnostic task did not return any multicollinearity, and vice versa. So here we see that the variance inflation factor for the first coefficient, log GDP per capita, is quite small, and by all means acceptable. And now, by the power of index function, we can uh, automatically recalculate that for each and every of our variables. So to recalculate the variance inflation factor for gross capital formation, we need to put the gross capital formation as our leftmost variable, and here input 1 as our uh, log GDP per capita becomes an explanatory variable in an auxiliary regression. So we regress variable 2 on all other variables, meaning 1, 3, 4, and 5. And that means that the variance inflation factor for gross capital formation is 1.06. Again, very small and not problematic at all. Now for FDI, 
we regress variable 3 on variables 1, 2, 4, and 5, return an even smaller variance inflation factor. Then variable 4, we regress on variables 1, 2, 3, and 5. Again, that's the highest variance inflation factor we've seen so far, but it's, again, uh, nowhere close to threshold values, meaning that is not um, indicative of any multicollinearity whatsoever. And finally, variable 5, we regress on 1, 2, 3, and 4, returning a variance inflation factor of 1.16. Again, that means that all five of our variance inflation factors are less than 5 or less than 10, depending on the threshold you prefer to use, which means that our model does not suffer from any multicollinearity whatsoever, which is good news, meaning that our model is sound and robust. However, if you were to encounter a high variance inflation factor, you would know where to look for potential improvements. For example, just remove the factor that gives you the highest variance inflation factor from the model, and chances are that the resulting model will not suffer from multicollinearity anymore. And that's the, again, another desirable property of our variance inflation factor test, which allows not only to determine whether multicollinearity exists, but also how to potentially combat that. And that's all there is for variance inflation factors, the maths behind them, as well as the implementation of them in Excel. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any first suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.